Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Movie House Concessions, the podcast where we pull a random film out of the old dump bin and see if it's any good. I'm Chris. I'm Joe. And I'm Shane. And this time around, Shane, you picked 2012's Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. I did. This one stars Steve Carell and Kira Knightley, who I think is Joe's future ex-wife, if I remember correctly. One can dream, Chris. One can dream. <laughs> So Shane, uh, you want to give us the summary and try and do it quicker than one of mine? That's going to be easy. You know my summaries. So. <laughs> yes. An asteroid is on a collision course towards Earth, and in three weeks, the world will come to an absolute end. One ordinary, dull, middle-aged man named Dodge, like the car, played by Steve Carell, decides to spend his time searching for his long-lost love from high school during the coming catastrophe. He meets Penny, a beautiful young woman played by Kiera Knightley, who is on the way trying to get to her parents' home in London. Do they survive their perilous journey? And can they get what they want? And by what they want, I mean what we want. And by what we want, I mean does it give middle-aged geeks the hope that the apocalypse means they will meet an attractive young lady, find love, and possibly get laid? There it is. Oh, I don't know. And they say romance is dead. <laughs> Um, so Shane, any fun facts you want to tell us about uh, this film? Well, the budget for this film was $10 million. It had a very poor opening weekend. It opened to almost $4 million and, uh, and then it's gross entirely. It was only about 6.5. So I'm, you know, sure they made money, uh, afterwards through various means, but it did not do well in the theater. I don't even remember it being out in the theater. This seems I, to have come and gone pretty quick. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know if it just played independent theaters, you know, like I have no clue. Um, it was nominated basically for two awards, um, the Saturn Award for a Best Independent Film, and that was in 2013. And in 2012, the Alliance of Women Film Journalists nominated it for the Special Mention Award of the most egregious age difference between the leading man and the love interest. Steve Carell was 50 and she was 27. I do want to know if uh, Steve Carell's dye job got an award because that was an awful lot of dye that they piled into his hair. <laughs> I didn't even think of it, the age difference between the two. Maybe that's what it was because... Uh... He didn't really seem terribly older than her to me. Well, I mean, I think he, he, there was definitely, I, I mean, I could see the age gap. And I mean, that, what, that was why I kind of, you know, pinged on the fact that, you know, you've got this guy who's obviously, you know, well into middle age, who still has this like really dark, you know, solid color hair, you know. And maybe it's just the character, maybe as a character, he's just vain. But I think... A lot of it was also just trying to make this romance between a much older man and a mu a, an older man with a much younger woman more palatable. And I guess within the context of the film, age really didn't matter. Mm, probably not. Actually, how, how old is Karen Knightley really, though? I mean, she's older than 27, right? I feel like she is in her 30s. She is now, and she may, I think when she made, oh, that's what the, I just read it off the internet, so it must be true. But, um, <laughs> You know, Abe Lincoln always says it's she was true. 27 at the time of that award, which was tw which was 2012. So I mean, it okay. is almost four years later. Holy crap! How old was she when she made the Mummy? Like she must have been yeesh, early 20s. Dang. Yeah, I don't know. What year was the Mummy? Was it before Phantom Menace? I think so. I think it was way before Phantom Menace. Oh, okay. I was kind of joking about this with uh, Shane before the podcast. Um, in some ways, this did remind me of the 40 year old virgin in, uh, in kind of the same manner that he, he kind of played the same sort of guy, but I mean, he was married in this one, but you know, personality wise, and I don't know if this is just a typecasting of Steve Carell. Well, I mean, 
to me, Steve Carell is a little bit one of those actors. You know, I mean, he sort of plays that guy a lot in a lot of roles. So I don't know if he was necessarily typecast. I just think that basically he likes to pick those kinds of roles. He plays them well. And I mean, he's sort of that guy, you know, make a lot of money doing that, I guess. I think his character was definitely, you know, kind of odd and definitely had, you know, some some personal quirks, which, you know, is probably why he, you know, got trapped in what was essentially a loveless marriage. But seeing Stephen Carell play a character different than like Michael Scott from The Office or, you know, the the kind of bumbling weirdo from the Anchorman series, it's always kind of strange to see him play somebody kind of serious. And uh, and I thought he did a good job in this. I think there's another movie where he played uh, some kid's stepdad, a total jerk. The Way, Way Back. Yeah, uh, yeah. A year later, which is a great film as well. I, I think I think Carell definitely does not want to see himself typecast as like a comedy actor. So, and I I, I don't think he will be if he keeps going like this. I mean, I think he did a standout job in this movie. Yeah, for me, he can sometimes be hit or miss. I I'm lukewarm in a lot of his films. For instance, I don't care for Forty Year Old Virgin um, or him in it, and I know a lot of people love that film, but sometimes his style just rubs me the wrong way and it didn't in this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought he was uh, a very touching and sympathetic person in this film. Yeah. I mean, well, he's a good guy in this film is the thing. He really is. And I mean, that makes him a really likable character and, you know, he does a really good job at it. He plays that character really well. So, you know, it comes off as a sort of just really realistic. It's a, it's a good role for him. I think that may have been what kind of uh, – that may have been one of the reasons why the movie did not do well in the box office because I did see trailers for it, and they kind of played it as like a pure comedy, kind of goofy kind of movie. And I think people went in to see that, and instead they get you know a good movie but one that's you know surprisingly moody and sad. You know? And I think a lot of people you know, didn't know how to handle it. You know, They went in there looking for a comedy and said they got kind of a dramedy, I guess, is what it's called now. A buddy film dramedy between mm. a man and a woman. And what did you think of Kira Knightley in this one? I don't really consider her uh, that much of a comedic performer, um, but I thought she she did she held her own comedically in this. I've always liked Kira Knightley as an actress. I mean, I think she's I think she does a really good job in this movie and in the other ones I've seen her in. Yeah, she she I particularly like her in this film. I think she does a really good job. I mean, she's really. She's really likable, and she's sort of, I mean, the thing is, when you do have a role like this with two people who are sort of far apart in age, you know, it's a little, I think it, the burden's probably a little, obviously there's plenty of 40-year-old and 50-year-old men in the world who could, you know, they could care less about dating a 20-year-old or whatever, and I think it, probably the burden of acting that part lies a little bit more on her, and mm-hmm. uh, she just does a really good job selling it. Like, you really sort of believe that something could possibly happen between these two just from the you know, circumstances they encounter on their voyage. And she does a really good job with it. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, this is a good movie. I think we all kind of agree on that. And I think it's because, you know, first of all, uh, Carol and Knightley, I mean, they did a good job because a, they made a romance between two very different characters at very different points in their lives. Um, however, shortly, summarily both would end. Uh, they made that romance believable and you know, secondly, the the ultimate al- actor's challenge was you may you cared about these people, you cared about these characters, which you know kind of made a much more powerful movie. Kara Knightley's character, I know this girl in the real world, this who loves her records and is always a little bit late and means well, but ends mm-hmm. up screwing up everything. I thought she was a very well-rounded uh, person in the short amount of time that they set her character up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, they they meet and then they go on a brief little road trip, I guess you could say, which is, it's the end result of this road trip was a little bit odd to me. But along the way, they met uh, a guy who uh, who uh, couldn't commit suicide because it was against his religion. So he hired somebody to kill him. Yeah, uh, I thought that was a very funny uh, uh, way to go. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the. I mean, the movie itself was, like I said, surprisingly moody. I mean, there were, 
like that scene with the uh, riot outside that apartment that kind of sets them on their way. I mean, that was actually a little scary. And you had like these these odd setups where like uh, at the beginning where Steve Carell, like he uh, sees a spider and in his apartment and first he's going to like flush it down the toilet. But then he's like, ah, it's the end of the world. Live and let live. (laughs) And the spider like during while he's sleeping at night, you know, we go fight him. And uh, yeah. And then, you know, you're you're thinking, oh, ha, this is kind of funny. You know, look what happened to him. And, you know, then he drives into work right into some guy committing suicide in a very not funny way. Mm -hmm. You know, the movie was very jarring to me in that sense. But, uh, you know, as you were saying with the, with the hitman, I think a lot of the humor in it was very, I mean, it was funny, but it was also very dark and, you know, had, it all had an edge to it. Everything, there was not a lot of funny ha-ha stuff to the movie. No, except maybe the Applebee's. That was, that was pretty funny. Yeah, with uh, the guy from uh, Silicon Valley, I'm blanking out on his name right now. T.J. Miller. Yeah, uh, he's hilarious. I like him in, in most of the things <laughs> Me he does. too. He was funny in this and then he was with Amy Schumer. Yeah, it was nice little cameos on their part. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, those lighthearted moments. It is true. It is a moody film because then you compare those to the moments of like, you know, when she's on the phone on the satellite phone with her parents. Uh, it's just a really well acted sort of little piece there where you're just like, oh man, it's so depressing. It's yeah, you know. Now, one of the things that kind of puzzled me was. Was the asteroid supposed to be hitting in the New York, New Jersey area? And so they were they were definitely going to be killed first. And like maybe some parts of the world were going to survive a little bit more. Because at the beginning, I kind of thought there was this thing like they mentioned something like the last flight out of town was on such and such a time. So I guess everybody left behind was stuck. So did you... Oh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't take it like that. I oh. took it like the flights have ended because nobody wants to. We don't. We can't get crews and people. Yeah. Nobody wants yeah. to work when the world's yeah. going to end in two weeks. Except yeah. his maid, which was sad in its own kind of way. Yeah, and a little bit funny also. Yeah, yeah. you know. But yeah, I mean, what would you guys do if you had three weeks left? I mean, there. Well, that was a question. That's actually a question I wanted to ask both of you. What I thought about when I started watching this film in a lot of ways is, to me, it almost takes sort of a a very different approach to, you know, basically how everybody deals with upcoming planetary destruction. You know, everything we always see rioting and all this stuff. And maybe that's because there's a chance in most things. You know, you're normally dealing with zombies and some people survive or disease and a few people survive. But this is going to kill everybody. There's just no way around it. So, I mean, was it sort of realistic? Because, I mean, there's no reason to loot. There's no reason to do anything. Nobody lives. Weapons won't help you. Nothing will help you. I mean. Except Speck, who's going to live the rest of his life with a couple of guys and a bunch of potato chips. <laughs> and a PlayStation. And a PlayStation. Dude, he, he can do it, man. I, I believe in Speck. Uh, well, yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's actually one of the selling points of the movie. Uh, I, I mean, for me, isn't that... In this movie, Keira Knightley and Steve Carell are the only two characters that are kind of focused on the here and now and actually getting something out of their last moments. Keira Knightley wants to be back with her family. Steve Carell wants to find his true love. Everybody else, I mean, Steve Carell's friends are all having parties and orgies. Other people are committing suicide. You know, other people are just, you know, trying to avoid thinking about the future by, you know, like those people at Friendly's having drugs and more orgies and stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, that's what kind of sets Kira Knightley and Steve Carell apart in this movie from hum- the rest of the rest of humanity, essentially. And that both of them are, they have definite goals and they're definitely trying to get something concrete within the remaining time in their life. I think that's true. I just thought it was interesting though, as a con- how they basically, I mean, you didn't see really any rioting in this film. Well, I mean, there was a huge riot that, Sure. When I mean at first, but I'm just saying yeah. the roads weren't clogged. There well, weren't, they they, they also were, had a budget chain. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I honestly, I think it was sort of a decision on their part to sort of play it like it just it, it wasn't like filled with like chaos and destruction and violence and budget wise or not. They could have at least alluded to it. and They don't. I mean, everywhere they go is fairly peaceful. I think it kind of would have been the way that one family was where they're finally telling each other how they feel, cursing. It, that, you know, 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It would be like, well, nobody's going to live through this. So because didn't the dad give the boy some alcohol too and let him drink? And yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I it think was just it's... interesting how they dealt with it. I mean, I can't recall, you know, any kind of movie where the end of the world is a central theme, and there's not basically chaos and destruction, you know, all around, pretty much, you know, as a theme. Well, I mean, I think the movie's got a pretty dark subject matter, but at the end of the day, it is supposed to be kind of a romantic comedy, even though it's got, you know, some very sad overtones. You know, they might not have, it might have been a story writing decision not to dwell on some of the, you know, realistic aspects of a doomsday scenario where, you know, people will finally think, well, hey, I'm going to die, so I might as well do what I want, you know, and that what they want being like some pretty ugly things. Yeah, maybe. I, I just, you know, I just thought it was interesting because, like I yeah. said, they don't really allude to it. And it just more seems like everybody knows the end is coming and it's sort of like, eh, I guess what I really want to do is be with my family or, you know, hang out with my dog or I don't know. Because they don't show it. They don't tell you. It's just it's just an interesting thing. That's all. I like that uh, the only person who I guess you could say saw it coming in some manner was the, the guy with the world is ending sign. And he was locked up in a jail just kind of chilling. Yeah, care in the world. Right. He's like, I'm right, motherfuckers. That's right. Yep. So besides the undertone of these two characters trying to find uh, their, you know, uh, her family and his his one love, there is this uh, this undertone of Steve Carell. Basically, he has nothing. I mean, his his wife left him, and uh, you know, but his dad is is still in the world, and he he's really not even trying to reconcile with his dad for his last. A uh, few weeks on Earth, Steve Carell probably despised his dad more than any other person on the on the planet. But he cared for Penny so much that he saw his dad one last time, which probably he did not want to do, just so she could see her family, which she cared for about. So I thought that was an interesting little twist as well. Yeah, it was. It was good. I mean, that whole little. The whole when he's about to take off in his little two-seater plane uh, moment. I, I'm know. still not sure how that's going to fly the 13 hours across to England right. on yeah. that in that little plane on mm. one tank of gas. But you know, it's a movie. Hey. Yeah, I mean, I think it was. I, I think it's interesting because that. Um, I mean, both Steve Carell and uh, and uh, Penny uh, Karen Knightley. I mean, you see both of them basically sacrifice for each other, right? Um, so Karen Knightley when they're Hold up in his uh that home uh Steve Carell's the the parents of Steve Carell's you know childhood love, and uh, Penny finds an envelope with her address on it that will like lead Steve Carell to this you know child you know love of his childhood that he wants to track down. You know, there's a moment where she's thinking, you know, do I give it to the, to him or do I hide it and just enjoy the time that we have left together? But she you know she chooses his happiness over her own. Mm -hmm. And she gives him that envelope. And then, you know, with the plane, you know, Steve Carell could, you know, have just avoided seeing his dad, you know, spent his last, you know, time on earth with her. But instead he goes, he reconciles with his dad so he can get her on a plane so she can go back to her folks, you know, sacrificing his potential time with her. And I thought, I thought both were a really nice touch that kind of dovetailed together. And on top of that, just a little, I don't know, continuity sort of, Thing. Uh, at the beginning when he met her and she was asleep at his place, um, you know, how incredibly hard it was for him to wake her up because she sleeps like a log. Mm -hmm. So it made it believable that he could pick her up and put her on his dad's plane later yeah. in the film because she, she slept so heavy. So they also had a lot of little nice touches of continuity like that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did not think that they – I did not see them working that plot point or working that character – aspect and again after that first time you know mm -hmm. i thought oh okay it's just kind of a throwaway but you know it actually becomes kind of a central piece to the action and you know i think uh, uh it's when i was watching the movie i mean i really started to like these characters obviously i think we all did and i just started wondering in the back of my head are they really going to kill these two guys i mean is there a uh, warning folks spoilers um you know are they really going to end the world you know with these two people that just found each other. And I mean, I really didn't want it to happen because I had really grown to like both the characters, but you know, in the end, I'm kind of glad that, you know, the movie did end the way it did. Cause 
Otherwise, if they kind of wussed out, it would have lost a lot of punch and a lot of its meaning, I think. You know, speaking of that whole sort of airplane scene, the first time I had watched this movie, when she took off on the plane and that was it, I sort of thought at first maybe the movie was going to end there. Mm -hmm. And that sort of Mm -hmm. uh, frightened me a little bit. But at the same time, I was like, you know, whatever. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. And then... You know, instead it shows them being depressed, depressed. I go, okay, it's going to end right now with him being depressed. That's sad. And then it doesn't. And then, of course, she comes back in the really, frankly, quite wonderful next few minutes, the last few minutes of the film. Yeah. Happened. And I love it, obviously. It is a fantastic ending. But that being said, because we always ask, at least you know, Chris always asks, was it a Hollywood sort of ending? And in this film, we talked about it at work today a little bit, and I, with one of the guys, Chris, I work with, who uh, has seen it also, and I was like, you know, I, I just wonder, and I, I mean, I love the ending. I think it's fantastic. I don't want to take anything away from it, but I wonder how much it would have changed the movie, and if it almost, it would have been a better ending in a way. I, and I'm not saying I agree with that. It's just an interesting question to pose at the airplane, basically, when she leaves, and you just end assuming she gets to where she's going, and I mean, it would just make it a very, very bleak film. Obviously, you'd probably want to kill yourself after watching it. But uh... yeah, it was already pretty depressing up to that point. As is, <laughs> yeah. I, I think, then have I think him die alone. The perfect moment. I mean, I, I really think I really like the ending of that movie. I mean, it had, it is good. It had closure and it had punch. I mean, I think it was really well done. I would have been okay with it ending at the plane. I would have been a little bit better if he was back at her place listening to the records. That would have been a little bit more touching. But I do think this was the right way to end it. Um, I'm glad they didn't do some sort of terrible, um, they survive somehow or they come back and they're in heaven. And, uh, you know, Optimus some, Prime flies in with a baseball bat and knocks the meteorite out of orbit. Some yeah, shit. you know, that, something yeah. completely dumb. So they at least went that route. And I think... It's kind of a combination of Hollywood ending with uh, independent ending as well because uh, they they got what they wanted in the end even though they still – spoiler alert – even though they still died. Yeah. So. Well, I mean I think you know Hollywood ending, they definitely if, – if it were a Hollywood movie, they, they would not have had a sad ending because sad endings don't sell in Hollywood. So they, mm-hmm. they, would, have, they would have done something different. They would have wussed out. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, even as sad as it was, I mean, Steve, Steve Carell's character, you know, pointed it out that they couldn't have met any other way, which is true, you know, based on where, where the, their character's directions, you know, it took the end of the world for these two people to meet and fi- you know, finally meet somebody they could fall in love with. You know, as tragic as it might be, it is in its own way a bit of a happy ending. Yeah, because they weren't, uh, they weren't stuck with the trivial things of life that blinded them from everything that was surrounding them at that point. Yeah. And, you know, fate as it was just kind of jammed them together. I mean, they could have easily gone for years without talk. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Kira Knightley's character, Penny, thought that Steve Carell's wife was his girlfriend or his roommate, you know, roommate. Yeah. After years of living next to him, you know, that would have just gone on and on, you know, assuming that, you know, his, his wife didn't leave him like at some point. Yeah, that that was a relationship that was definitely doomed. Yeah, that that was actually Steve Carell's real life wife, actually. Oh, was it? Movies. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, dude, that I think that picture of her that he's got is just great. That kind of blank grin that he's <laughs> that she's got in that photograph he has of her. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, she's in love with you, buddy. Yep. Uh, Shane raised a question: What would what would we do if we only had three weeks to live? You know, it, it, if a planetary meteor were going to wipe us out, or a planetary asteroid? Um, you know, I'd probably probably hang out with friends and family. Honestly, I mean, I don't think I'd want to try and risk traveling and you know potentially being stuck away from f- people I cared about near the end. You know, Shane, what would you do? I have no idea. I hope I don't ever need to find out. Uh, <laughs> we all hope we never. Have basically, to. I don't. I don't, I don't even want to put any thought into it. But yep, same thing. I mean, I think that's, that's the question, man. I think that's really what a majority of people would do. Yeah, I could tell you one thing. I would want to be outside and trying to watch the thing hit. 
You know, I'd have to be there with you, man. I mean, that's like a literally a once in a lifetime view, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's no way to avoid it. You might as well have a nice fireworks show on the way out. Yeah. Any last thoughts on uh, on seeking a friend for the end of the world? I was pleasantly surprised by this movie because I thought I, I actually had seen trailers for it uh, in the theater. And I thought it was going to be kind of a goofy movie. And I can't really do goofy movies cold. I mean, if I I was kind of, if I'm kind of sour, just kind of feeling like worn out, goofy movies tend to annoy me. And I was kind of in that mood when I saw this film, and I was pleasantly surprised. Um, it is definitely the saddest comedy I've ever seen, but also I think one of uh one of the ones I've probably enjoyed the most. Well, I mean, obviously, I suggested this movie. I liked it a lot the first time I watched it. Uh, watching <laughs> it again uh, was a pleasure. And uh, it's just, you know, it has a good story. Uh, it has a, a good cast, who, and all of them just, you know, just hit their parts just right. And it's just really sort of a lovable film, to be honest. And it is, there are definitely depressing moments, but, uh, I mean, it's probably too depressing. It's really sort of its own film. It's sort of too depressing in a lot of ways to be a date film. It's not necessarily a, a comedy film. It just sort of... Hits a nice little mark that I don't see very often in films. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I'll suggest it to people for sure. So uh, in my book, it is, uh, you know, it definitely was a winner. I'd watch it again. Uh, you know what? I, I would say that it would probably be a good breakup film in that if you weren't sure of your relationship with your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever the case may be, you could probably watch this. And at the end of it, take a look at each other and ask, hey, are, are we these people <laughs> or should we break up and try and find a relationship like this? Get well, your win and get some more popcorn and just leave. <laughs> it, I mean, it is. I mean, the thing is, it does sort of fall into that sort of, I mean, romance movie thing, which isn't bad. But it's almost like, you know, it, it's such a touching film in a lot of ways and really sort of, you know, uh, it's one of those movies that basically gives everybody hope for true love. Yeah. I don't know if true love exists for everybody. I don't know any of those big questions, but it is the kind of movie. I mean, Joe's right. You would watch it and be like, whoa, if I'm not this happy, maybe I should be. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's possible or not. I don't know if it's even just a movie fantasy. I don't know if it exists for anybody, but you know, but it you is owe it those... to yourself to try, I guess. Is what <laughs> right. This movie I mean, that's, tells that's... You. That's the thing, right? I mean, you're like, well, maybe. So, I mean, it definitely does that. It gives me hope for finding a 27-year-old girl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, Steve Carell can be very hit or miss. He, he he either works really well or I just don't care for him at all. And uh, I would say more of his films I don't care for him. But I was pleasantly surprised by him in this one. This is definitely the most depressing of the films out of all the podcasts I've done. But uh, I don't consider that a bad thing i i do think this was a very touching and sweet film that made me laugh and uh it, it was very thought-provoking so i think it was a i think it's a great film and it's definitely one to keep watching well that's it for today's movie house concessions review please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well if there's a film you'd like us to review, please send us an email to comments at moviehousememories.com and give us your name, your location, and film choice. And finally, if you are of the social media persuasion, you can look the MHM Podcast Network up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And please give us a follow when you find us. On behalf of the whole team here at Movie House Concessions, we'd like to thank you for listening. And this concession stand is now closed. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The song Rock On Brutta is brought to you by Mirwan Nimra at nintentine.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Concessions, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC, unless otherwise noted. Mm -hmm.